Thanks Chris um, and welcome everyone to this talk on MVVM Cross. Um, I may call it MVX for short during this talk and uh, that's kind of its pet name because um, MVVM Cross is a little bit of a mouthful to say. So I'm just giving you some history about MVVM itself. Um, a long while back Smalltalk had something called the application model. Uh, Martin Fowler in 2004 he, he took a look at, MV at uh, the application model and he presented something he called the presentation model. And really what his idea was, his, his key um, point was, to take widgets, to, to take things on the screen like checkboxes and text boxes and sliders and all those things we used to put in the UI, and to stop using them directly, and instead to use code behind to have their values. So that instead of having a checkbox with a boolean, you would have a checkbox and you would have a boolean and you would keep those two things in sync rather than relying on the UI itself to present these things. And in 2005, the following year, John Grossman um, blogged from Microsoft and John was working, I think, on the Avalon project and on Longhorn. So he was working in WPF and he was working in Vista. Um, and he, he blogged about MVVM itself. He blogged about model, view, view model. And he said that um, really what he was looking for and what they were achieving through MVVM inside Microsoft was they were achieving a separation between the widget level, the view and the, the stuff that was presented on screen and the data flow of applications. And he said that this was giving them um, you know, great advantages in terms of being able to um, you know, customize the UI using specialist designers and specialist UI developers, while at the same time having great data flow using the data developers and the application developers on that side of things. Um, and also it's, it's worth, you know, if you've got some spare time looking through his blog posts from 2005 and beyond, because also he's, he, he was also very open about some of the limitations of MVVM and about some of the disadvantages as well. So, you know, particularly he was talking about the fact there is an overhead with MVVM because it does use a lot of reflection. Um, and also he was talking about the fact that there is a development overhead as well. So if you've got a very small project, perhaps you shouldn't even think about MVVM. Um, you know, and if you're just doing a demo, perhaps adding MVVM just uh, complicates things. However, at the same time, obviously for more full applications, he was very much a uh, behind the idea and uh, publishing out there for the rest of us to follow. So also back in 2005, um, I personally had finished about 10 years of development work. Um, I'd mainly done C++ stuff. I'd done a lot of COM, a lot of ATL, a lot of Borland's object window libraries and uh, Microsoft's MFC. UI. Um, I'd also done a smattering of other, of other languages, um, but uh, and I'd had a, a remarkable uh, sequence of successes and failures um, in startups mainly, um, particularly things like we, we pushed out a radio system across the world um, for DAB, um, for which we got kind of a gold award for British Computer Society, and that's still in operation today. Um, but we also had, you know, projects canned. We had all sorts of uh, successes and failures. Um, I then took a year off travelling, and uh, Nicola and I went everywhere, particularly um, South America and Australia. had a great time. Um, but when I got back in 2005, um, one of the first things I did was I attended the very first developer, developer, developer conference here in the UK. And um, it was quite an eye-opener to me, um, because I sat there as a guy who had a year off, so I vaguely remembered how to code. And I sat there and uh, the guys in front of me weren't talking about C++ at all. They were all talking about .NET and C Sharp. Um, they were talking about things like ORMs. They were talking about things like unit tests. They were showing me tools like ReSharper and DevExpress Code Rush and all sorts of other things, which just did you know spectacular things that I never dreamt of in C++ with my, uh, my headers and my class files. Um, and during the day, I actually wrote down, at one point in the afternoon, I wrote down a... Uh, a sentence on my notes um, and it was I am a dinosaur because I really did see in front of me that, that people were doing spectacular things with code they were writing a lot more um, functionality than I could write um, and they're writing a lot better functionality than I could write so I really did um, at that point open up to the fact that you know it was time to switch to C sharp and it was time to switch to better tools so as well as uh, as being an MVVM cross introduction today um, I hope you don't mind indulging me a bit that this is also a little bit about evolving my own personal dinosaur um, as I've moved forward and, uh, and get better and better tools um, and better and better ways of working and producing you know, new apps. So um, what I'm hoping to cover is a little bit of MVVM theory. Apologies for tripping over the word. It's 
kind of important today. Um, a little bit about how that theory works in .NET, um, how Microsoft have applied it. It's important always to remember that, you know, just because Microsoft have applied it one way, there are plenty of other variations and there are plenty of other ways that it can be done. And that this is not just a .NET um, technology. Um, there's a great um, JavaScript library out there now called Knockout um, that does MVVM in, in JavaScript and HTML. Um, there are there's a, J a Java library called ZK that does a really good job. So um, keep your eye open, keep your mind open about using this in other frameworks as well. Um, but obviously this is a Xaminar. Um, I'm going to be talking about Windows Phone, about uh, iOS and about Android and about WinLT. So you know this is going to be about .NET today. Um, I'll then spend as long as I can on code because that's what most of us really care about. Um, and then after that I will um, hopefully have some time to talk a little bit about some of the other stuff that's in the MVVM cross library because as well as doing MVVM we also have to have you know dependency injection framework we have a plugin framework and we talk a little bit about portable class libraries and unit testing and then hopefully after that I'll have some time to talk through some examples and some of the things that people are doing and some of the influences that have come into MVVM cross so diving into the theory um, it won't surprise you at all that MVVM is actually got three parts to it, or maybe you're expecting four. Um, the first one is model. Uh, model is all the background code that you're used to writing, so it's what I call normal C sharp. So, for example, you know, it's web service calling code, it's database calling code, local SQLite, for example, it's algorithmic code, um, quite a lot of it's asynchronous, perhaps it's code that talks to things like accelerometers and things, which is, you know, on the device. Um, all of that is kind of back-end code and is, is there for, you know, your game, your business application, uh, your consumer application, whatever it is that you're building. And that really shouldn't be touched too much by the MVVM approach. And it's probably very similar to what you're doing because you're probably doing something like an MVC approach already. The view, the next part of this, is um, really that the, the view is... Um, in our sense here, we're talking about um, having um, a view being a page in Windows Phone, an activity in uh, Android, or a UI view, con uh, view controller in um, iOS. So it's not really a, um, a view in the sense of being a widget in Android, or a control in, uh, in, uh, in Windows Phone, or a UI view in iOS. It's, it's slightly higher than that. It's the collection of things, so it's more like a UI view controller. Um, and if you think about it at that sort of page level, then that's really what a view is in MVVM terms. Um, it doesn't mean you have to use a follow, follow a page navigation kind of paradigm, um, but it's a collection of kind of UI widgets um, that have a meaning together. And then behind that, what you have is a view model, and this is what's new and what's kind of innovative in, in MVVM and what's used um, to make the distinction of this pattern and view models so for every view so every every page in our kind of paradigm at the moment you have a view model and that view model will contain um, properties that map to the view so if the view has a button then the view model will have a property which is a command which is what happens when you click the button if the view has a text box then the view model will have a string which is the contents of that text box if the view has a checkbox then the view model will typically have a boolean that is the you know on off flag for that um, for that checkbox and then finally as an example if the view has like a date picker then you would expect the view model to have a date time variable that maps straight over to that thing and that's what MVVM is um, there's kind of a, a little box in the middle here on this diagram for those of you who are watching um, and you can see that that middle box is called the binder and that's really part of, of whatever the framework is that you've got for running MVVM um, and you can roll your own framework, you know, there's nothing magic here, it's a very simple principle. But um, if you're using a framework like MVVM, then you expect the framework to supply the glue, the data binding slash binder layer, and that that will somehow magically make sure that the view and the view model exchange values seamlessly without you as a, as a developer or as you as a designer having to really worry about it. So just following that through at a more detailed level, um, if you did have a view, if you had it with it, it's got a show button on it and it's got a hello world text box on it, then if you click the show, you would expect the binder, the glue underneath, to somehow turn that click into a function call on the view model, and that function call is actually on a command on the view model. 
The view model will then do whatever processing the application needs. So it will call into the model layer, perhaps it calls off to web services, perhaps it calls into local SQLite databases. And as a result of that, at some point afterwards, perhaps synchronously, perhaps asynchronously, some values will get changed. The view model will then change its properties. When it changes its properties, it will notify the binder and view layer. So it will say, look, these things have changed. And then it's up to the binder and view to actually make sure that the text box, hello world, changes to foobar or whatever. And that's it. That's, that's the kind of entire principle of the flow. Um, and um, I'll just you know, quickly talk through how .NET implements that. Um, you know, because obviously that could be implemented in JavaScript or whatever, but here we're looking at .NET. Um, and uh, the key thing is that um, view models, sorry, I got my slides slightly out of order here. Um, view models implement, and they always have to, public properties. Yeah, and that's what the key thing is. And you'll see the public properties always look a bit like this guy that's on the screen. So, you know, and typically what you have is a public bool, say, is searching, um, and that will have a private variable behind um, which is just returned in the get method and when the set method is called you normally can't try and raise a method that's a, an event that says oh is searching has changed um, and the way that that's actually kind of bubbled up through the framework is through an interface called I notify property changed and I notify property changed is very simple it's just a single event that kind of fires this is the name of the property that's changed so th there's there's really not a lot of code to this which is why you can always roll your own framework if you want to um, or you can use a, you know a really light framework like the really good one that Laurent has produced in Switzerland called MVVM Lite so if you, if you just need something really lightweight take a look at those sort of guys um, particularly if you're on the Windows platforms only um, for collections so if you do have to you know if you're a if your view model is, for example, a customer and the customer has a collection of orders, you know, a typical uh, Northwind type scenario, then you've also got an interface called I notify collection changed. And that just adds a little bit to property changed, really, in that, you know, if it's a collection, you might want to notify clients that there's something being added, there's something being removed, something's been moved, or perhaps the reset action, which is everything has changed. Um, and the good news is if your collection is quite small, then there is a, a really commonly used class called observable collection, which implements this guy, holds everything in memory, and you know it's just a drop-in replacement for a list really, but will have these add remove replace type events that it just fires when you call the add remove, etc. on that collection. Um, and then finally, the, the last kind of interface you really should know about if you're doing MVVM is iCommand. Um, and by far the most important within iCommand is the execute method. Um, and this is done for action. So when you have a button, then it will map to an, uh, to an instance of I command so that when you click it, an I command execute will be called. Um, you'll see that execute does have a, um, a parameter on it, which is just an object. Um, and the, the, that parameter can be used, for example, if you want to map, instead of mapping to a button, if you were mapping to a list box and you wanted to pick up the selected item changed, then what you'd pass in the parameter is what it's changed to. Um, but typically, you know, you don't really need to worry too much about these in details, but it's nice to know the interfaces that the, the framework is using to actually allow you to implement your platform in MVVM. So just to recap, um, you've got these three layers, model, view, view model. Um, you don't really need to worry too much about the model at this stage, um, but the view and the view model talk to each other and the view particularly uses public properties on the view model and it can set those values and it can also call i commands which are also exposed as public properties um, and in going in the other direction you have i notify property changed and i notify collection changed for the view model to tell the view and binder it's time to update the ui um, i will you know i think this will uh, drop out when we look through the code which fortunately we'll be able to do in a moment so why are you doing this just to, to bring it back why why do you care about this separation and this architecture you know none of us have any problems producing apps um, why are we adding a pattern and a complexity and architecture in there um, and just to come back and, and really stress this so um, you know the original reason that John Grossman pushed out there was to enable awesome UI and data development in parallel and to kind of enable those parallel skills to have separation and to be able to get on with things um, Another reason is to allow unit testing of code because when you rely on state being in widgets like in checkboxes or whatever it's quite hard to unit test the code because you have to have that UI layer. If however you are 
you know, actually looking at code as a view model, then all you've got is public properties, and they are very easy to manipulate from uh, from unit tests. So that's one really good reason why you should, you should consider MVVM or a similar type approach. Um, another reason is because when applications start get it, to get a bit larger, then it's really nice to have a common architecture across the entire platform. Um, so you know, if you are working in a team of one or two or three or four or six or ten or twenty, then it's really nice if all of the code has been architected the same way so that you as a developer can go to any piece of that code and you can understand how it works. Yeah, um, it, it just breaks down those barriers if people have, have agreed to some conventions for how they're going to operate. And then finally, the, the real reason we're here talking today is because MVVM does enable lots of platforms to share code. Um, and it enables it to share code at like you know a higher level than, than you'll typically see in kind of the, the Xamarin Debos and things like the MWC because we actually share some of the UI behavior as well as some of the model code. Um, some people will, may argue that's a bad thing. Um, I hope to persuade you today it's a really good thing, but obviously it does depend on your application. You know, don't force a Windows Phone user flow onto an iOS user. You know, always keep your options open and consider whether you're doing the right thing by the users as well as the right thing by the developers. So let's get into some code because that's where we all live and we all uh, enjoy working. So the example that I'm going to um, do today is an example of a Twitter search app. So this is what the Twitter search app looks like on, uh, uh, on uh, Android. So you can see it's a very simple two-page app. It's got uh, three controls really, well four controls if you like on the front page, a text box, a random button and a go button. Um, you can see that you can hit random and it will change um, the text in the text, bo bo uh, text box. You can also type the text box text in if you want to um, and you can you know, obviously hit go to go to the next page. So um, that's the, the application. It's pretty small, pretty, you know, noddy. It, it is an example just for this session. Um, and to some extent, it's not the type of thing that I recommend MVVM for. Because just as, as John Grossman said back in, 19, uh, back in 2005, you know, if you've got a small application, if it's really self-contained, don't, you know, go off and apply a huge architecture to it. Um, because, you know, there are practical reasons why you know you can just hack that sort of thing together in 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 a couple of hours. Um, you don't need to worry about it. However, as your application grows, as you need to maintain it, as you need to scale across a team, that's more where you start to think about adding uh, you know more architecture to things. So let's just look at the code for that Twitter search that you've just seen. Um, apologies for waffling on a bit, um, but um, what you'll see is you know we've got a very simple um, uh, project here. And oops, let's not come into that one. Um, and uh, it's a very simple project. It's Twitter search.ui.droid. It's got a um, a few classes in here like atom const and constants and tweet and Twitter search, which are all to do with the model. So if we take a look at one of them, if we take a look at Twitter search, then what you'll see is that Twitter search um, has you know it's pretty much a static class the way it's used, um, and it has the code for the web request in it. And then it has, you know, so HTTP web request, and then somewhere it has a stream reader, and then somewhere in the stream reader it uses X document, so it uses link to XML to parse out the response from Twitter, and then that's used as the search, and then all the other classes here are similar and support it. So that's the back end, that's what's our model, and you know, it's, it's already okay separated in this project. Um, and then what you'll see is we've got two activities the main activity, which is this guy. Um, and that's the first page that you've seen, so that's the page with the go button and the search box and the random label. And you can see it, it's a typical monodroid project in that you know we have these guys up here as variables and uh, it's a typical monodroid project in, the, in on create. We attach to those things, we perhaps we um, have some you know some clicking onto the labels um, and, and we respond to those events. Um, we've also got some application logic in here, just for example. So we've got a should search method, um, and this application logic checks, you know, is JavaScript the search term? In which case, it says no way. That's a banned word. Um, and we've got, you know, some uh, logic in terms of the label clicking, and that's the main activity. Um, 
and you know it, it's reasonable as an activity um, the only things I'd say about this and you know more for demo purposes today are obviously it's not very testable you know how would you test whether or not should search is actually operating as, as it should be um, and it's obviously also it's um, it's not directly any of this code um, portable at this stage you know you couldn't take this activity across to iOS for example so the other activity is the results activity, and this one's a bit larger. And the reason this one's a bit larger is because it's got the list in it. Um, but it's set up exactly the same way. The, the uh, UI is loaded from XML somewhere here in the set content view, you can see. And in the set content view, once you've loaded it, you get hold of you know um, controls using their IDs. Um, and uh, then somewhere here, you set the adapter up. So the adapter for a list is the thing that, that kind of says, um, you know, you want a UI for item number four, this is how you're going to get the UI, and that's done again by inflating XML. And you can see that when you inflate the XML, you then have to do the find view by IDs, and you then have to fill things in. And there are a couple of tweaks we've got here, so actually one of the things that's in our tweet is a time, a date time, and we don't want to display, you know, a date time like the 5th of June, we want to display a date time like four months ago, so we've got a method called time ago that we've got in this in this class, and you can see it's just normal C sharp code. Uh, and also we've got an image, which is the profile image, and you can see we've kind of got a um, a download data, a web client that we call for every single cell in order to push those things through. So um, that's the the demo app, and as I've said, you know, there's nothing particularly wrong with this demo app. It works quite nicely. It's it's there. However, it does lack testability. And also, if you looked at this and thought, how are you going to get port it to other platforms? Then you, you know, some of these things you'd port by probably cutting and pasting these classes. Um, and the UIs themselves, you'd probably just say, right, well, I'll start the UIs afresh in the other platforms. Um, so let's just see how we do that. Normally, I'd go through a five-stage process where I'd kind of gently ease you into this. Um, but actually, we're just going to take the giant hop here into the same um, project, but this time. Um, it's going to be implemented in MBVM cross. So, what you'll, the very first thing you'll notice is we've now got three projects in our solution. Um, the top one of these projects is the core project, and this guy is a portable class library. Um, and it's going to contain all of the application logic. The second one is a class library, that is a unit test, and this is a full .NET framework unit test. Um, and it takes advantage of things like NUnit, and it takes advantage of things like the MOQ mock um, mocking framework in order to be able to do really quick, really powerful unit tests. Um, and then the, the quick, by quick I mean quick to develop. Um, and then the last one here is the UI itself, which is, you know, the grandchild of the, of the previous one, um, and we'll show that in a moment. So if we just take a look at what's in the core project, then what you'll see is we've got an awful lot more classes than we had before. So if you take a look, we've got some conversion classes, um, and we've got uh, the model classes, we've got the view model classes, and then we've got a couple of application level classes at the bottom there. So let's just talk through us through very quickly. The first one is the converter. So this previously was just like a little method in our um, in our view. And what we've discovered is that you know we can pull it out, and we can use a, a common pattern called iValueConverter, um, and the, the value converter just allows you to pass in the object that you want to convert and to get out the one you actually want to see in the end. Um, and the advantage of having this in this in our portable class library over here is that this does give us a um, it does give us portability on our portable class library. So you know, sorry, that's a tautology, um, but it, it does give us the ability to use this code across different platforms, and if at any point in the future we want to change this algorithm, so you know we don't like these constants of 100 seconds or whatever, then we can change them, and they will change across all platforms at the same time. If at any point we wanted to internationalize this, we could internationalize it here, and it would change across all platforms at the same time. So that's the converters. Um, we then have an interface for our Twitter search provider. So everything else here in terms of Twitter search is exactly the same code. But what I've done is we don't really like having static classes because they're not very testable. Um, you can test them if you use things like type mock. 
um, or what's it called on, on the Windows version, or come to me later. Um, but uh, we prefer to have a wrapper around these guys. So what we've done is we've just put a simple wrapper, a simple interface called iTwitter Search Provider in place, and then a very simple implementation that wraps the static method. And what you'll see is that enables us to inject a version of Twitter Search Provider later. So it enables us at test time to use a test version and at real runtime to use a real one. We also use that same sort of technique in other parts of MVVM Cross to um, insert the right native implementation. So for example, if you have something that needs a camera, um, so you know, a, a media picker type thing, then we use that at runtime to insert the Droid version or the Windows Phone version. Um, or similarly for things like accelerometer um, and for things like even things like sending an email where you need it, the correct native one. We use that same sort of injection pattern quite a lot within MVVM Cross. Okay, so that's the model. It didn't change much. That's the converter. It was just kind of pulled out into its own um, place where it could be tested. It can also, obviously, because it's been pulled out, be reused across different applications. Um, and that might be of interest to some of you as well. You know, if you have a lot of applications to write, this is a way of sharing code using portable class libraries. Um, and uh, then we move on to the actual view models. So as I said in the kind of preamble, view models rely on having properties and view models expose things like commands. And so what you'll see here is our view model, which is our view model for our main page or home view model. Um, it's got a constructor in which it sets itself up by picking a random search term. It's got a, um, it's got a public property called search text, which is what's obviously going to map to that uh, text in the middle. It's got a public command called search command. It's got a public command called pick random command. And then it's got the implementations for those guys. And so that should for you really be you know, quite straightforward how it's implemented. And you hopefully can recognize some of this code and see how it's been pulled across. Um, the one line that is a bit unusual in here is the navigate. So you know before, I don't know if you really saw it in the, in the direct droid example, but in the droid example what we did was when you needed to do a search we created an intent and that intent we then stuffed a variable in as an extra and then we you know, said can you start an activity with that intent please. Um, in cross-platform code you can't really do that because intents are definitely not cross-platform. So instead of that, what we do is we actually tell um, the MVVM framework underneath to say, please, can you navigate to a view model? And what the view, what the MVX framework then does is said, right, they want me to navigate to a view model. And it says, well, how do I do that? And it looks and it finds a, a view that corresponds to the view model. Um, it starts that view. It finds the view model that corresponds to the view, maps them together, and then displays them on the screen. That is typically done you know, in, in Droid by actually showing a whole new activity or a fragment or whatever, um, but it doesn't have to be. If you are, you know, implementing something that's on a tablet or a different UI and you need just part of the screen, some sort of pop-up shown instead, there are opportunities to override the behavior and to actually do that um, as you need to. Um, so that's the home view model. Um, and then, you know, Hopefully none of that code looks too complicated to do. It is a little bit verbose, so obviously you know there is some overhead in writing. Um, these guys, these raised property changed. Um, there are some projects around, um, so I think uh, Simon Crop, for example, has um, some some projects which allow you to decorate your properties, and then it will um, it'll uh, do some some comp compilation time um, modification of your properties to actually generate code like this. I don't use those at the moment because they're not really supported across cross platforms, um, but they are interesting because I think that sort of um, aspect oriented programming um, could simplify this code a lot. Um, and it would just be interesting to see that happening. Um, and then the second view model is uh, Twitter view model. And if you take a look at Twitter view model, then um, you can see within here, again, we've just got a very simple um, setup. Um, we have a uh, constructor that takes a string search term. So if we just go back to that navigation that we just had, you can see that when we actually ask for the navigation, we also pass in a search term. Um, it's limited to strings at the moment as a navigation mechanism, and that's because it has to go down and through intents and through URLs, etc., to do navigation. Um, but that's still quite a powerful way of, of navigating. Um, and so what will happen is, you know, this view model will get created with the right search term. Um, during the constructor, it can start the search, and then all these other flags like is searching, um, the collection of tweets here, 
these are all exposed as public as public properties with raised property change so that the UI knows when to update. And you can see everything in here is, is exactly as you expect um, from the previous one. Um, the only um, slight surprise you might have is looking at how the Twitter search provider is, is um, acquired. And that's done using this dependency injection mechanism that I talked about. So all it does is it kind of asks the framework, has somebody registered a Twitter search provider? And what we'll see is at test time, you know, we register a, a dummy one. And at runtime, we register the real one, which was in this models folder. So that's it pretty much for the this portable class library. Um, when I call it portable, it's because it's been set up using file new. And when you do file new, I've chosen portable. Um, and then I've configured it. So you can see here, hopefully, that it is a, um, it's been set up to work with .NET. It's been set up to work with Silverlight. It's been set up to work with Windows Phone. It's been set up to work with Windows 8 and with Mono for Android and with Mono Touch. So you can see how um, what I mean by portable. Um, this one project can be included in all those separate um, targets, and this one project can also be included in, um, you know, as a, a compiled assembly, can be included in all those targets as well. Right, so that's the core. What we've then done is we've created a full .NET DLL, um, and using NuGet we have added uh, mock and we have added NUnit. So you can see those are in there, um, and we've added a few, you know, serious references for uh, MVVM Cross, um, and then that's enabled us to write tests. So very quickly, I'll show you, you know, a couple of tests. Um, there's something like the fact that we wanted to test for the band word, and the band word is JavaScript. Um, and you can see that what we do is we create our navigation framework, we create a home view model, and then we just, you know, check that there's no navigation that occurs in that situation. Um, I won't talk too much about these guys, but I will just show you that they do run. Um, so hopefully if I do this, I can run the unit test. I'm using uh, ReSharper to run the unit tests here. At least I hope I am. Here it comes. Um, and ReSharper, um, I should probably say a thank you to JetBrains because they support the open source community. Um, and they have you know, provided a license for ReSharper for free um, for using in MVVM Cross. So thank you very much, JetBrains. So hopefully this is running. Why is it not running? Is there a breakpoint or something? Oh, it's because I've got this uh, zoomed in. So um, yeah, sorry, it doesn't update when it's zoomed in. But you can see here, hopefully, that you know all of my tests pass. If I um, open these up, you can see the details of the individual ones. If I was to go back and I was to break the code, you know, so somebody has come along and edited it and they've done it wrongly, then let's say that somebody in home view model has you know broken my um, my band word and that they decided you know the band word should be HTML and then when they've done that and you run the rerun the tests what you should see I'll just run them from here what you should see is that now obviously it'll rebuild and hopefully one of our tests will fail so exactly as we expected we have a failure it gives us details about what line failed you can make your tests as verbose as you want to um, and you know, it immediately flags it up. So you can run these things automatically at uh, at runtime, at build time, if you want to. Um, and it's really you know a very useful thing to have in place, having unit tests for all of your view models um, and for you know all of your service code as well. Right. So that's the test, very quickly shown. Um, and now let's just take a look at how the UI project has changed. Um, so what you'll notice is that obviously we've now lost in here um, the um, we, we've lost the model code because that's all gone up into the portable class library. Um, and instead of the previous activities, we've now got a, a few. Well, we've got a, a, some boilerplate code at the bottom there of setup and a splash screen activity. Um, and we've got a linker include, please, just for release time. You know, it's a standard monodroid type and monotouch type thing where the linker can be a bit too aggressive. So there's no real code in there, um, but there is some some stuff that that is done for. Um, uh, for code, um, and then what we what we have is we have um, two views which replace the previous activities. So let's just take a look at what code is in these guys now. And so in home view, what we now have is all of that code that was previously in the activity is now dragged down just to setting the content view. Um, and then in Twitter view, which was previously the the results page everything has become down to just setting the content view again. 
So what this means is that you know there is no C sharp at all in our activities here, and instead everything has moved across into XML. So if we take a look at the XML, then what we'll see is that we've got some data binding going on. So this is the XML for the home page, um, and we should be able to see this in the Xamarin Designer as well. Um, and what you'll see is you know you've got your search label that you expected top left, um, and then you've got your top right text view. And you know, this is normal Android layout, except for one thing at the end, which is that we also have, you know, here we have this pick random command, which is a binding. Um, and hopefully it's quite readable. It's a bit of JSON. It says on my text view, on the click event, please bind that to something on the view model, which has a path of pick random. Um, and that's all it does. And then, you know, at the time that you inflate the XML, this will get bound. Um, and then in the edit text again, you'll see that we've got a very similar setup. We've got um, at the uh, we've got for the edit text, we've got a two-way binding. So what that means is, if something gets typed into the UI, it will be transferred to the view model, and also if something comes from the view model, it will get translated to the UI. So the binding is definitely two ways, and you'll see that in some of the other demos we've got, where we've got sliders that adjust things, um, we've got you know colors that change, all sorts of things that happen in two ways. Um, and then finally, we've got another binding at the bottom here for the search command. Um, and for the Twitter page, let me see if I can open this one in the Xamarin Designer. Um, it won't be quite as pretty in the Xamarin Designer because it does use a custom control. Oh, it's saying it's already open, sorry. Um, so um, I'm not opening this one in the Xamarin. Oh, I am opening this one in the Xamarin Designer. So um, what this shows you, hopefully, is that you know it's a normal. Oh, I may have upset it opening it twice. Um, okay, so it's a normal um, page. It's got two controls on it. One of them is this progress bar, and the other one is this very special list view. And if we take a look at the source for this list view, uh, I shouldn't have opened it in the Xamarin Designer. Let me uh, open it up in the normal one again. Right, so um, apologies for that little thing. It's just the. Um, it does some uh, HTML formatting of text in that thing. It's not quite as readable. So um, what we have for the list view is we have our own special bindable one. And all that really adds is a property called item source on the list view. And we bind that to the property on the view model called tweets. And then we've also got an item template. And that says what to fill the list in with the tweets. Um, and uh, you know, so what view to use for each list item. Um, and we then also got the progress bar. And the progress bar has a visibility property. And that's bound to his searching using a, a converter, which, you know, because his searching is a Boolean flag, whereas actually visibility is a three way enumeration on an Android. And so his searching is converted to that enumeration using that converter. So let's just quickly take a look at the list item, the final bit of binding that goes on here. And on this list item, hopefully, we'll see. Um, so we have um, a few things here. We've got an HTTP image view, so that's a specialist image view. That just exposes an image URL that can then do the downloading and the caching of the image automatically. Um, we then have a text view that's bound to author. You know, very straightforward. We're binding the text to the author. Um, we have a time text view um, that is binding the timestamp. Uh, sorry, again, it's binding the text to the timestamp field, and that is bound to you know using a converter of time ago, which is the guy we saw in the core. And then we have the content text view, and that's bound to title. So that's the way these things are set up. Um, you can see that all of the magic occurs in this XML, um, and the views themselves are just here. One other thing to note is that everything here is done by convention. So there isn't a configuration file anywhere that says these are my view models and these are my views. Instead, it's really just looking inside a folder called view model and seeing whether or not there is a class called view model. Um, and it's looking in the folder called views and seeing whether there is a class that ends in view. And then it takes a look at what it inherits from to find out what type of view it represents, what type of view model it represents. Um, so I hope you can see how that fits together. Um, and you know, in terms of what's been achieved by moving this way, well, you've got a test harness on all of our application logic, which is nice to have. It's nice to have for regression testing as things grow and change. Um, we've got portability of all of our core, which we'll demonstrate in a moment. Um, and we've got some simplification of the UI. However, overall, we definitely haven't simplified things. Yeah? So don't you know, think this is a magic bullet. Um, we have pulled in a lot of new external code by, by doing this. 
um, and we have obviously also increased the number of classes. So if you want to just build a simple demo, this is obviously complicating things a bit, but if you want to build a real app, hopefully it will simplify things for you. So let's just move on to the final step, and the final step is to take um, that same code and to make it cross-platform. I don't know what I changed, so I won't save that. Oh, I possibly have just broken my unit test by not saving. So the final th step of this is to take that same solution and what we do is we add in a few more projects and so what we should see here is you should see that we've still got core, we've still got test, we've still got the UI for droid but we've now got three new UIs. Now obviously within the space of this hour that I've got for this talk um, I'm not going to talk too much detail about all of these guys but let me quickly run through a few of them. So first of all Windows Phone 7 and what you'll see is it looks a lot like the Droid project in terms of setup. Um, there's a little bit of, um, of uh, conversion going on for native converters because they're not portable. Um, and there's some setup code at the bottom. Um, and the setup code basically just you know tells the application how to start. So you know there's nothing too complicated in here. And the key thing is it says please start my Twitter search on startup. But what we get is inside the views folder you'll find we've got a, a couple of XAML pages with some code behind. If you look at the code behind here, you'll see that the home page is linked to the home view model and there's not much C-sharp code in there. If you take a look at the Twitter view one, again you'll see the same sort of setup. It's a Twitter view, it's linked to the Twitter view model, there's not much code in there. Everything that's really done is done in binding, so if we open up these guys Hopefully we'll see, you know, I'm not going to talk you through this in detail. Um, anybody who's done Silverlight or WPF will be familiar with this, but there is binding that goes on in this guy, and you know, you can see it's a sim very similar binding to what we had in the Droid example. Um, so that's there, and Twitter view again is very similar. If you take a look at the binding at the code, there's just binding that goes on in here. It's very straightforward to, to see how that happens. So let's just see it running. Yeah, um, let's just to prove that it's linking. It's linking to twittersearch.core in the same way. So if we uh, run this guy up, I'm not sure which emulator it's going to come up on. Ah, it's coming up on Windows Phone 7 emulator. That's cool. It's trying. It's deploying. And. Hopefully this is also coming through on the screen capture. Um, oh, it's feeling in a bad mood. Let's go back to it. So hopefully it will start up. The fans kicked in, so something's going on here. Ah, so our application has loaded. I'm not sure what's up with the emulator. Um, but hopefully you can see this is the same type of UI as we had before. Um, we can choose random and it should change to a random term. And if we choose go for kittens, then hopefully we will get the Go coming back um, and the code downloaded. The emulator is running a bit slow here, sorry about that. Um, it's nowhere near as slow as the Android emulator, so I'm quite happy to uh, let it run. So you can see there, here come back our tweets about kittens, um, and that's where you know it seems to work quite happily. Apologies for the bad language on John the Bastard at the bottom there. Right, um, so that's... Um, WP7, it shouldn't surprise you at all that you know MVVM and data binding is kind of native in WP7. Um, for WinRT, um, there's a bit more gunk in this project. Um, the, the default um, packages, the default app wizards for WinRT generate quite a lot of files, um, but at the root of it all there's a few familiar things to you. So there's a common setup which again just kind of says please start the Twitter search. And then there's some views, again done by convention. Um, and in these views, there isn't a lot of code. Again, there's something that just says my home view is attached to my home view model. And in Twitter view, the same sort of thing happens. We have a Twitter view that is attached to a Twitter view model. And the UI is done by binding. So if you take a look at the Twitter view, then you will see that there's some list items in here and they have title and author and they have profile image URL and they're all bound somewhere to the list of tweets. Can I spot it? Binding tweets. So there's the list of tweets. And that's how it's all set up as a UI. Everything else in here is stuff that you know you can edit in Blend, you can edit in Visual Studio, you can use the designer, which is this guy, 
um, it's not the most exciting design that one um, and we then also have the home view and again the home view is done by binding so somewhere in here we should have a very familiar set of things so here's the binding here so you should be able to see that we have you know a button that does random and it's bound to pick random command we have search text that is bound to way to an edit text and we have binding that is a search command so that's the way that's set together and let's just see if we can run this guy up please start on the right monitor WinRT so hopefully this will run and you should see again it's the same code behind the same portable class library that executes so when we hit random we get the code if we want to change this to you know let's see what people are talking about Xamarin oops sorry Xamarin see what people are talking about Xamarin today and if I type it right we get back things about Xamarin and we get back a few familiar faces and so you know this is our normal WinRT um, UI um, all bound together okay uh, and it looks like Chris has been trying to talk to Stephen Fry um, right so uh, let's um, come back out of that um, the last one to talk about is touch and touch is a slightly different beast to um, to the previous guys that we've looked at um, and the reason it's a slightly different beast is because the XML format that you use for UIs in um, in iOS is called zip and um, it's not human readable or human manipulatable as you can see so it is human readable but I wouldn't want to edit this myself it's got lots of numeric cross references it's got lots of things that go on that you really can break if you try to edit these things so what instead of using um, you know XML level um, properties instead of that we use the fields that the Xamarin designer very nicely generates for us so you can see here it's generated a few outlets um, and these are just uh, local fields they're not properties um, and what we can do is when we do the view dude load we can add bindings manually so the fact that we had a go button we can bind touchdown to that and bind it to the search command the fact that we had a random button we can bind it to pick random the fact that we had an edit means we can bind its text to search text two-way so that's the way we've done that guy um, you can also if you need to in your projects use monotouch.dialog or our variation of monotouch.dialog we've got some changes in there that allow you to change individual rows um, one by one rather than reloading the whole dialog um, and but but largely the code is pretty much the same as the wonderful monotouch.dialog um, or you can inherit from things like map views and you can inherit from things like uh, uh, just table view controllers and so that's what we've done for Twitter view and so for Twitter view again you know it's a little bit more verbose than the other examples because we're doing things in C sharp um, but you'll see that for every cell what we do is we bind the title of the cell the detail of the cell and the image URL um, and then we also have a binding here for the that's the table source overall and so you can see it is a little bit more verbose than you get from the other guys um, but the overall effect is pretty similar so if I just switch to a demo um, and I will fast forward through it so the demo here is running um, let me just see if I can get it full screen for you the demo here is running um, you know mono develop on the Mac um, and if we just fast forward to a slight demo part this is the iPhone and the iPhone UI will look very familiar to you and you can see random changes things if you hit go kittens does seem to be my favorite search um, then you can uh, you can do the search and it looks like it's going quite slowly but you can pull this back so that's the um, UI ported to iPhone um, but obviously one of the questions that comes up is when you port to iPad you might not want this entire screen interface so for Twitter search what we also did was we put in a special iPad UI um, and let me just fast forward a little bit to the iPad UI um, and what we do for the iPad UI is we do actually it's just booting at the moment is we do actually use a split view um, and when the split view is used what you get is you get um, the zip used on the left and then you get the results on the right um, and this is exactly the same controller code it's exactly the same view model code we're just hosting it slightly different in something called the presenter um, and this is the way that we see you know tablet apps will probably use these multiple view models you can do it as well if you want to use pop-up control you can do it in all sorts of other ways um, and so that is a, a very quick introduction into how we have done iPhone and iPad um, it, you'll probably see this coming into Android and coming into um, uh, Windows 8 as well because those aren't you know entire 
page interfaces once you go to a tablet quite often. Okay, so that's a very quick guide to some code. Um, I've probably talked too long, apologies Chris, um, but I just wanted to show you what a project looks like. Um, hopefully you saw that we moved from a single mono project, which is absolutely fine as co code goes, um, to a portable class library with a test harness with um, a smaller UI project. Um, but overall, external dependencies got larger and there was more code to write in doing this. So, you know, there, it's not 100% win doing MVVM. Um, however, as your project gets larger as you go across platform, hopefully you saw how we helped to get a lot of code reuse by doing that. Um, and if I'd shown you adding new views and I'd shown you adding new view models, you'd have seen how quickly we can add them once we have this framework in place. Um, hopefully you saw how data binding works. Um, and I talked a little bit about how you can use dialog. I talked a bit about Zibs and I talked about XAML and I talked about Android XML and I showed some C Sharp. Um, just uh, changing tack slightly. So that, that's pretty much the end of the MVVM part. Um, and, and again, uh, hopefully you've seen some of the advantages that, that I think we can get by using MVVM. Just wanted to talk briefly about some of the other things that we are using currently within the MVVM Cross. It's not part of MVVM, but it is part of the framework. Um, so the first of them, as you've seen, is portable class libraries. Um, I personally am a huge fan of portable class libraries. Um, the work that the team in Microsoft have done, um, Dave, Daniel, etc., um, in bringing portable class libraries to version two is stunning. Um, and you know things like um, system.xml.link that's now in there, um, and uh, and just the amount of code that you can you can use across the amount of platforms, it, it just um, simplifies your projects very straightforwardly. I now use the same portable class libraries on servers as I use on MonoDroid and MonoTouch. Um, other people are you know, particularly hesitant about um, using portable class libraries. Um, I understand why, because I've been through the pain of the last year as well. Um, however, the tooling is, it continues to get better, um, and uh, I hope that you know, that carries on. Um, and you know, I haven't shown you any of the problems that there are in portable class libraries set up at the moment. Um, there are some still, but they are reducing month by month, and I, I just encourage you to experiment with them. Obviously, if you've got a, a project you need to deliver, then do something that works for you, because it's much more important that you deliver and then live to fight another day than you use the, the latest, best technology right now. Um, however, give them a try, take a look. Um, obviously, if you're using MVVM Cross and you're using vNext, you will be using portable class libraries, but that doesn't mean you have to structure your code as portable class libraries if you don't want to. Um, unit testing, I've shown some of that. Um, I'm still a bit embarrassed about the level of unit testing I do. I think I can do a lot more. Um, however, it's it's been a real interesting part of my evolution from dinosaur status. I'm still a dinosaur, but it's been an interesting part. Um, and I need to do more of this. Um, it's quite interesting that once you get into kind of the test-driven development approach, then you, uh, you start um, changing the way you code because you kind of do start writing the tests first um, and it gives you a, a way of coding rather than having to write UI to exercise a bit of code you do just start writing the unit tests um, and it, it typically means that you can you know write code quickly because you don't have to go through the first five pages to test what's on page six you just start you know the unit test and it runs um, you obviously still have to do manual tests on top um, but I, I definitely would consider, if you haven't been using much unit testing, um, give things like NUnit a go. Um, there's also within MonoTouch, there's a really nice unit test application, a wizard. Um, give it a go. It, it's stunning what it does for you. Um, yeah, I, I used it recently in a demo and everyone was like, why haven't we got that in Windows Phone? Um, well, the, the quote that's on screen here at the moment is from Kent Beck, who's kind of recognized as one of the, uh, one of the founders of test-driven development. Um, it, it, it's from a Stack Overflow question where somebody said, how deep should I write my unit test? Um, and his answer is remarkably down to earth and it says, you know, write them so that you test a bit. Don't test every single extreme, you know. Um, and also he does say, when you're coding on a team, change the way you work. You know, collectively you do you need to cover other people's mistakes and you do need to cover mistakes that, you know, people might misunderstand how you, how you intended your code to be used. Um, the final thing to talk about is plugins, and I'm not going to talk about this um, in this slide. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Sphero. Um, and so Sphero is a project that I've been working on recently um, and uh, is, if I can just pull it up, 
Um, Sparrow is a robotic ball, um, and some of you have no doubt seen um, the Xamarin Monkey. And um, I'll try and shut him up in the background. And so um, it's a robotic ball, and you can see it here on the screen. And you can see that we have built a controller for it, and we've built in there um, color changing. So this is MVVM that you're seeing on the screen here at the moment. It's MVVM Cross. Um, and we've ported this to iPhone and to Android and to WinRT. Um, and you can see the accelerometer being used there. And hopefully you can see a few other things. So just coming out of that video, and hopefully I didn't speak over myself there, um, the way it's implemented is, is something called plugins. So obviously in a portable class library, you can't talk to Bluetooth because Bluetooth is pretty native. It's very much a native layer. And obviously in a portable class library, you can't talk to the accelerometer because the accelerometer is a native layer. And obviously in a portable class library, you can't ask to open the Bluetooth settings because the Bluetooth settings are in the native layer. So what we do instead, and let me just see if I can switch to code. Um, so if I open up the um, source for Sparrow Workbench. Uh, I don't know what I've changed again, so I won't save it. Um, if we open up the source for the Sparrow Workbench, what you'll see is that within this project, when it opens, we have a list of plugins. Um, and these plugins, each of them consists of a core portable class library. And in that core portable class library, what we try to do, and again, the unit tests are in the way, and um, what we try to do um, is put as much code as possible in the core one and we put the interface so the thing that, that a portable class library can call so let's just zoom in a little on Sparrow so this is our Bluetooth um, plugin um, for controlling that robotic ball and what you'll see is that within Sparrow we have got a lot of commands and these are binary um, bit bashing things um, but they're all portable code because they just use byte arrays and properties. Um, we've got a command with actions, a little helper. We've then got our interfaces. So these are cross-platform interfaces for finding Sparrow, for connecting to Sparrow, and for sending in those commands. Um, we've then got some messages and some um, run loops. And we've then got a little bit of boilerplate in terms of an exception class and a plugin loader. So if we take a look at, for example, you know, iSparrow Finder, which is the first entry point, You'll see that you know we've just got the interface defined here, uh, defined here at the plugin level, um, but if you also look at something like a uh, base Sparrow command, you'll see we've got quite a lot of you know shared bit bashing code, constants, etc. that are used across the platform. So that's the um, the core one. If you then look at how it's extended in um, in a particular implementation like Windows Phone, then you'll see that this is where we actually provide the the Bluetooth connectivity. Uh, why is that not building? Let me just build it and see if it feels happier. Um, and if we build that, you can see that um, you know the syntax highlighting comes back, um, and you can see you know it's really small the footprint of the Windows Phone extension compared to the footprint of the um, of the PCL. So we put as much code as possible in the PCL and then we just extend it to provide the native implementations. And this comes back to the dependency injection type idea that I talked about earlier. And you can see it's similar again for the, the Droid example. If we take a look at what's inside its Sparrow Finder, then it's just Android specific code to talk to the Bluetooth adapter. And that's the way this is, this is put together. And you can see we've got different plugins here for these guys. So the code overall, when it's used in terms of being used in a, in a portable class library, if you take a look at the services and view models that are in this project. And you can see this is more of an example of you know a more sophisticated project than we were seeing earlier with, uh, with Twitter view. And you can see how this has got much larger. Um, and what you can see is that when we actually use Sparrow, so for something like the Sparrow list service, which does the finding, you can see all we do in the portable class library is we get hold of the service, so that the, the pointer to the Sparrow finder, and then we ask it to find. And this is an affordable class library exactly as earlier. You can see this library is supported on all of these guys. Yeah, so everything except Xbox 360, you can run this code on. Um, and you can run it as a binary, as I said earlier. And at runtime, it will simply pick up the correct version of the uh, Sparrow Finder, um, no matter what you deployed to. So, you know, this code runs on Droid, it runs on Touch, it runs on the Windows Phone, it runs on the Win WinRT. 
and um, you know, it, it talks to Bluetooth, it talks to the accelerometer. Um, we've got other plugins that you can use off the shelf. You've got a geolocation plugin, we've got a sending email plugin, we've got a um, open a web browser plugin. All of these things are just you know pretty straightforward code to add. Um, and if you want to write your own plugins and you want to use them in multiple projects, then these are all assemblies that you can build once and distribute later. Um, so I hope that, that gives you a quick introduction to plugins. Um, they are magic. Um, I do intend in the next few months to, well, hopefully in the next month, to actually get them outside of, of MVVM Cross. So the projects who don't care about MVVM can carry on using these plugins because I think they are incredibly useful to use. Um, I don't know if I need to repeat why we're doing all this. We're doing it really so that different platforms can share code um, you know, and to give us some common architecture as you saw there. Um, right, um, I probably talked too long, for which I apologize to Chris, um, but I'll quickly go through a final little bit on um, on some of the awesome contributions and some of the awesome um, things people are doing out there. Um, the first contribution is where we started a year ago, and this is Monocross. Um, and uh, the guys, particularly ITR Mobility, have come at uh, cross-platform coding um, from a different angle in terms of they've really come at it from MVC and tried to make MVC everywhere. Um, take a look at what they've done. If MVVM, you know, you've taken a look today, don't like it, take a look at Monocross as well. Um, and you know, by all means, take a look at both frameworks and start your own as well, um, because you know, we all have different requirements, um, and also writing your own framework can actually uh, help. Um, you know, you understand how you're writing your code. Um, I, I don't recommend everyone writes a framework. Um, if you find yourself writing a framework, quite often, you know, you're wasting your time. I've wasted a lot in the last year. Um, but take a look. Take a look at what's out there. Um, you know. There, there's no harm in learning more. Um, and this is where we really started a year ago. Um, and we started on a project called Connect Star Wars, which was a Twitter, Facebook app. Um, the team at the bottom there also got up to about seven or eight people in terms of developers during the project at various different stages. Um, and this was really what kickstarted um, MVVM Cross. Um, and I think about a year ago, end of November last year, uh, John, Imagi, and I had a uh, uh, meeting, uh, I think it was John who uttered the words, let's just write an MVVM framework, how hard can it be? Um, moving to more modern times, um, this year in the last few weeks, um, Rhett, John Dix in Canada, um, has published a, um, a cross-platform um, UI for Wishlist, um, and it includes Azure mobile services, it includes a website, it includes Monodroid, Monotouch, and Windows Phone. He's used the very latest um, build of MVVM Cross, but he hasn't used portable class libraries. So for anyone who you know still wants to do file linking, um, it's really interesting to look at what he's done. Um, and he's also obviously you know brand new to MVVM Cross. He's not done a lot of dependency injection in the past. He's working with a couple of libraries, Xamarin Mobile and Azure Mobile Services, who don't support PCL. So it, it's a really interesting project to look through. Um, and to see, you know, um, what one developer can do. I don't know how long he took to do it. I don't think it was very long. Um, and, you know, hopefully it shows, you know, how maintainable and uh, extendable code can be um, if you take this MVVM cross approach. Um, Rune in Norway has done a wonderful uh, Dropbox example. Uh, it's on GitHub as open source. If you speak Norwegian, there is also a slideshow, a slideshare presentation that goes with it, a complete training course. Um, highly re recommend you check that out. Also, if you want to use Dropbox, which I think it does, it's a really good example of how to use Dropbox cross-platform. Um, Jason in the UK working at Aviva, which is a huge insurance place. Um, this is not open source, but this is an example of the type of application you can build using MVVM Cross. And if you're an enterprise and you need to, you know, be very sensitive about testing your code um, and about, you know, maintaining your code longer term, take a look at Aviva Drive. Um, and take a look at what those guys have done in the enterprise using MVVM Cross across two platforms. He's also written a very nice comment about um, MVVM Cross, which is awesome. Thank you, Jason. Um, Cheese Baron, well, he wrote a lovely post back in August about um, his first experiments with MVVM Cross. Um, it's really worth going back and reading that, um, you know, about how he's had a breakthrough, some of the challenges he had because of my lack of documentation, um, but also how, you know, these things um, have changed bits of the way he codes. Um, he's also got quite a few on his GitHub accounts, quite a few ports of um, 
views from Java code to Monodroid code and he's done binding on some of those things so all he had to do to do binding was to add public properties um, and it's well worth taking a look through some of those um, absolutely awesome um, I guess you know quite a few of the names that I'm mentioning already from the uh, Xamarin community um, Greg in New York is experimenting with MVVM Cross at the moment um, he's coming at it from a really interesting angle in that he's coming at it test first um, so he is actually writing lots of view models and lots of unit tests without writing a single UI. Um, it's absolutely fascinating to watch and uh, I really want to follow the blog and find out how it goes. Um, he is then porting, you know, after he's got all of the application flow and logic working as unit tests, he's then going to put the UIs on top. Um, and it's a really fascinating way of looking at it. It's a different way of working entirely from anything I've ever done um, and I may give it a go myself. So um, absolutely awesome take a look. Um, Jason.net I want to mention, um, he's got a great tagline, um, James Newton-Smith, um, no pressure, no diamonds, I really like that. Um, but the real thing that I want to mention is that uh, Jason.net I took as a compiled portable class library back in May, and since then I've used it on every version of Monotouch I've had, and every version of Monodroid, every version of WinRT, and every version of Windows Phone 7 and 8, and that single DLL has just worked. So, um, you know, it's a brilliant example of portable class libraries. Um, take a look at, you know, at how he's used portable class libraries. It's, it's pretty much 90, 95, 99% of, of the full JSON.net, um, and it just works. And so that's exactly where I'm aiming with MVVM Cross and with the plugins, that you just take hold of these portable class libraries as compiled DLLs, and they just work. Um, Olivier in France has pretty much written most of a book about MVVM Cross. It is in French. Um, it, it's only three or four chapters, but it's still um, quite a, an impressive um, put together of 60 or 70 pages of text. Um, what he did was he took an existing Silverlight app. So for all of you out there who've got Silverlight or have got WPF that is now kind of a bit legacy, um, he showed how to take his existing Silverlight app and his existing um, uh, web service, so it's an existing ASMX style web service, and just use it straight away within Monodroid and within WP7. Um, and it's it's you know it is in French, so it's it's quite hard to read for me, um, but it is a good read in terms of code reuse, not just modern day code reuse, but code reuse from three or four years ago as well. Um, and uh, Dan in Italy, he's done a presentation in Italian, so if French or Norwegian wasn't your book, um, check out Dan's um, presentation on SlideShare. Um, absolutely awesome again, thank you Dan. Um, in, from Hungary I believe this entry is, um, There's a this just appeared six months ago on uh, GitHub. Um, it's a full uh, shopping product type app, um, it includes barcode scanning um, and it, it's absolutely really wonderfully clean code, um, you know he's obviously picked up what MVVM Cross is all about, so if you want to just take a look at a, you know he's called it a simple shopping list app, um, it's a really good place to start for Android development. Um, and finally in this list, Daniel, who actually works for for, Red, uh, for Microsoft in Redmond, um, he's done a talk in Build and he's done a, quite a few really good blog posts about um, portable class libraries. Highly recommend you follow him on Twitter and you check these things out. Um, and when you come across bugs and problems, um, I highly recommend you pester him. Sorry, Daniel. Um, but no, seriously, if, if you talk with him on Twitter or you post questions on Stack Overflow, which is by far my preferred way of, of doing questions, um, then he comes back with really good advice. Um, and, you know, he and the rest of the team and the team at Xamarin all seem really committed to portable class libraries and making them work. So um, it's absolutely awesome. Thank you. So hopefully we've covered all, everything I said we would. Um, we've run over time. Sorry, Chris. Um, I do go on. Um, and uh, I apologize if I've uh, gone over too long on certain things for people. Um, if you want to join in, tool up, share some code, architect your code, and just get going. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of information out there. Um, that wish list um, readme from John, the readme and wishlist in John Dix's uh, wishlist app, is a pretty good place to start about how to tool up for this. Um, and you know, you can just use the binaries for MVVM Cross to get started. Um, the project itself is on github in github.com slodge mvvm cross um, i do occasionally break the tip i apologize um, it's partly because i'm checking in from three different machines um, i will work out how to do a cross-platform build at some point soon um, and also daniel who is in that slide has has done an amazing job by actually getting uh, monodroid supported within um, NuGet 
So I'm looking at pushing binaries, you know, kind of more formally to NuGet in the very near future. Um, there's other talks available if you need it, and there are other links available. Um, if you go to my blog, there's actually a, a page which is all about um, links that you can follow. Um, so that might be the best place for you to start. Um, and generally, this is what I do. You know, I, I write C# -sharp all the way from the cloud layer, um, using ORMs on the on the cloud, um, and business logic, and things like MVC to get code back, things like Web API um, to get code back across to the client, and then on the client, I write you know all of my code in C# -sharp with a little bit of XML on the front. And it is an absolutely awesome way of doing cross-platform development. Um, you know, that's why I'm here talking about it. It's because I do absolutely adore my job. It is cool as anything, although it's possibly not as cool as dinosaurs. So I thought I'd give one last hurrah to the dinosaurs. Um, some credits for this talk. Um, the diagrams that we had up front for MVVM were actually borrowed from uh, the Java framework for MVVM. Um, and the dinosaur images throughout have been Wikimedia, Wikipedia Commons. Um, and sample projects, as you've seen, they've been credited on the slides. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I, um, I work for Sirius. Um, I am the only employee for Sirius at the moment, but we do team up um, to do larger projects. We love working on really ambitious projects, so if you've got some uh, something that is awesome, then please do um, consider coming and talking to me. Um, there's a link there for my blog, which is lodge.blogstop.com. There's the link there for the GitHub for MVVM Cross again. Um, if you go to github.com slash lodge, you can also find ball control, which is the Sphero example. Um, if you want to contact me, then um, Stack Overflow for questions, please, for MVVM Cross. But if you do need to contact me, um, or you want to offer me work or anything, then me at slodge.com, um, or offer me beer. I'm, I'm very open to these things. On Twitter, I'm slodge. Um, I use that as a work account and as a social account, so be warned. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much to, Zaminar, uh, to Zamarin for putting on Zaminar today. Um, and thank you everyone for turning up. Um, I'm Stuart Lodge and I'm still a dinosaur. Thank you.